Hey guys, this is Mike Mahaffey, the old bastard BJJ guy, here for BJJ Mental Models. Back in my day, we had to walk uphill in the snow both ways to get to the academy just to learn some crappy technique from a random purple belt. You kids have it so easy, because now you can just subscribe to BJJ Mental Models Premium and get tons of great audio courses to learn new techniques, enhance your mindset, and entertain yourself. You can even get personalized rolling reviews from some of your favorite BJJ Mental Models coaches, including me. It's like having your own seminar, you spoiled little whippersnappers. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to BJJ Mental Models Premium right now, get off my lawn, and go train. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And in this week's mini episode, I want to talk about dominant angles. This is one of those topics that for when you think about it at first, you might think, okay, isn't this really obvious? Do I actually need to have angles explained to me? But bear with me. There's a reason I want to have this conversation, and I think we're going to get some value out of this. Maybe some new ideas or insights that you'd never thought about before. Angles are one of those things where I think most people in jiu-jitsu, if you asked them, would say they're important. And I think most people would tell you they know what they mean, but do they really? If we were to sit a bunch of experienced grapplers down in a room and ask them to all tell us, what is a dominant angle? Are we sure that the answer we would get from everyone is the same? I bring this up because a story that Rob Bernacki once told me, which I really liked, was how he made a point of making sure that he defines the word base for people. Because base is a very important idea, everyone says it's important, and everyone acts like they know what it means. But if you actually ask people to engage and explain, you get a variety of different answers. And sometimes in jiu-jitsu, or in life really, we see things like this. There's concepts that just seem so obvious that they don't need to be explained. But sometimes, because something seems obvious, you take it for granted, and maybe you're only thinking about it at a surface level, or thinking you understand what it really means because you've never taken the time to unpack something that seems so basic. So let's unpack the idea of angles here today, much like we would with other concepts. What is a dominant angle, and why is it important? The idea of an angle is pretty clear, how my body is aligned relative to yours. But what makes an angle dominant? Why are some angles better than others? You might say conventional wisdom tells us that we want to get behind someone or get to their side because it's harder for them to fight back if they can't face someone. And I would say that that's probably generally true. But I would also say there's clearly exceptions. For example, donkey guard is a position that used to be banned from tournaments because on its face, it seemed so ridiculous. But it's actually tremendously powerful, especially for people who are going for the legs. If you pull donkey guard on someone, you have the ability to effectively cut their body in half and focus on their legs with other hands getting in the way. So you've turned your back to someone, but still you're in a powerful position. How is that possible? Similarly, people might say that being turtle is bad because your back is turned, but it's very possible to attack or dominate someone from turtle. There's definitely counterexamples. And I think most people would agree with that. They would say, all right, there's exceptions to the rule. Sure, maybe there's times when you can get away with doing something like giving up your back, but generally you don't want to do that. And again, I would agree with that, but I would ask, what makes the exceptions then? If we agree that there are some times when it's actually okay to give up our backs, what makes those exceptions work? What makes them different from the main case? And why is it that we keep telling people that giving up your back is bad if we agree there's exceptions to that rule? Maybe this idea of a dominant angle being where someone's not facing us, maybe it's a bit more complicated than that. If you asked me to say, what are the real advantages to cutting a dominant angle on someone? Really, the benefit is that as human beings, the main weapons that we've got at our disposal, like our arms and our legs and even our head, they're easier to use if something is in front of us. We're front-facing animals. We're just going to be able to use our limbs more efficiently for things that we grab in front of us versus behind. Our arms and our legs are not meant to be dexterous when it comes to reaching behind us. Our neck is limited in certain directions. To me, that's why getting a dominant angle is such a powerful thing. But then how do we tell, is this angle I'm going for actually dominant or is it not? 
because clearly there's more at play than just are you facing someone. Getting onto someone's back isn't always going to be the advantage that you think it is. So let me give you an example here. If you have forced your opponent into turtle, as long as you can keep your arms and your legs out of their grasp, you're probably in a good position as the top player. But if you allow the person on the bottom playing turtle to latch on to one of your levers, like your arm or your leg, suddenly that position no longer feels that powerful. The person still is facing away from you in either case, but in one case where they haven't grabbed anything, it does not feel intimidating at all. In the other case, if you've ever had someone two-on-one your arm when they're pulling turtle, it's a very difficult position to actually get out of, and it's a bit scary. Another example from turtle is the Peterson roll, which is where you trap someone's arm in your armpit, and then you roll, and they have to come with you. So in all of these situations, the person playing turtle is not facing forward, so you wouldn't think their angle is dominant, but somehow they got a degree of control. So I would say when we're talking about dominant angles, what do we really want? It's not just about getting behind someone or beside someone. It's about putting the angle of your body relative to theirs so that their weapons just aren't effective anymore. Going back to that example of turtle, if I let you trap my arm in your armpit, then that angle is no longer dominant for me because even though you're facing away from me, you're actually the one with leverage. You've managed to tie up my arm despite the fact that I'm not facing you. So it's not just about getting behind someone or beside them. It's about aligning your body to theirs such that their weapons just can't be effective. Sometimes this can even happen when you're facing dead on. A lot of pressure passes against someone playing guard. You might be facing a person dead on, but if you can get the angle just right, you can put them in a position where suddenly their arms and their legs don't feel that helpful. So again, having a dominant angle doesn't actually mean you have to get beside or around someone. You can be facing them dead on. It's about taking their weapons out of play. So that's really the lesson I'd like to transfer here. When you think about angles, understand it's not just about getting to a person's blind spot. They can still attack you from there if you're not careful with how they control your limbs and how they control their own. When you're thinking of dominant angles, don't just think of getting beside or behind someone. Think of getting into the places where their arms and legs can't grab onto me, can't attack me anymore. That's what a dominant angle is. So I always encourage people to think in this way about cutting angles rather than just getting beside or behind someone. Hope this has given you an extra little bit of nuance, maybe something to think about, and a new way to look at what maybe we thought before was a simpler concept than it actually is. I hope this was helpful. We've got 14 other mini episodes in the feed right now. I definitely recommend checking them out, of course, as well as our main feed episodes, our newsletter, and our premium stuff. Everything we make, all of the free stuff and the premium stuff, lives at bjjmentalmodels.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks again for listening to this, and we'll talk to you next time.